We have a very exciting episode of the Botany Bistro today, and I can't wait to get started. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you're all having a lovely Friday morning. Um, and so I'm glad we're going to share this bistro together today. Um, this is our sixth session of the Botany Bistro, and uh, we have had a lot of fun bringing this to you from the Civic Garden Center, which is located in Cincinnati, Ohio. We've been here since 1942. We were started during the Victory Garden Movement, and we have continued to support community and school gardens, as well as doing some restoration and conservation work for some of our local natural spaces. And if you would like to know more about the Civic Garden Center, I encourage you to check us out online um, or come for a visit if you're close enough. So it's a beautiful place to walk around and a wonderful place to learn lots of things um, about plants and about community building. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and keep rolling with our bistro today. My name is Mary Dudley. I am the ecology education manager here at the Civic Garden Center. And I have a passion for plants, a passion for people, and it was just a really great fit. We designed this Botany Bistro series to share information, scientific information about plants um, and freely give that information out so that we can empower people in our community and around the world to do more with the plants that they love in their gardens uh, and that they appreciate in our natural spaces. And so we have talked about basic botany in previous sessions. We just wrapped up a two-part series on plant morphology. And so now we're digging deep into plant anatomy. And morphology and anatomy have some similarities, but the difference mainly for anatomy is that it includes close up zoom in of plant pieces. And so the use of microscopy is very important for some of the things that we are going to talk about today. Uh, let's see what's for lunch. So I've had lots of salads uh, in previous sessions and we've been eating leaves and flowers and fruits. Um, today I wanted something a little heartier and it's starting to cool off finally in Cincinnati. Um, uh, it's been very warm and so those cooler temperatures, um, I decided to have some lasagna today. Uh, and the lasagna is going to be used as a model, uh, for further on in our little chat today. Um, it smells really good. And this is a vegetarian lasagna. Um, I did not make it myself, but uh, I want to thank my husband for being a wonderful chef. Uh, and I can't wait to dig into that. It's going to be really yummy. And so we'll get into um, a little bit about plant cells, what's going on inside the cell of a plant. Um, we're also going to talk about microscopy and how that technology has changed over time. Um, and next time, we're going to be talking about plant tissues. So in two weeks, we'll have another bistro for you. And uh, we're going to dig into plant tissues for that time. So we won't be talking about that very much today. Might touch on it just a little bit. Um, and so you will have some homework at the end. Uh, hopefully some of you have been doing your homework. Uh, just a way to apply what we have learned and kind of remember it a little bit. Um, and also share with us on our social media pages. Uh, your homework for today is to tell us about your favorite organelle. Um, so you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we chat. At the end of the session, I will also turn on the chat function. So if you have any questions, please keep them on a little notepad, keep them close by, and you can add those to the chat after the talk. All right, let's go for it. Um, for those of you that haven't used this platform before, if you want to click on that little pin, if you hover over the video and there's a little pin there, it will make sure that that video stays large enough for you. 
Um, but I've also designed this so that you can just listen. And so if you're going for a walk or you're running errands, um, don't worry, you won't miss uh, a lot that won't be visual. So uh, you'll be all set. Okay, let's get started. So we talked last time about flower structure and the external parts of flowers and the different organs of flowers. In a previous session, we talked about leaves. We got really into leaves. And so I wanted to pick up from those morphology talks today. And so when we talked about leaves, you can see with your naked eye the veins of the leaf. You can see the margin of the leaf, which is the edge, and whether or not that is smooth or if it has ridges, um, lobes, things like that. So those are kind of parts of a leaf. In the middle of the leaf, we have the mid rib that goes through and then it connects to the petiole and the petiole is what connects the leaf to the base of the branch or um, stem. And so we have all these things that we can see with our naked eye, um, but let's really think about what's going on inside that leaf. And so if you would zoom in on that leaf, you would see that it has a several layers to it. So this is where the lasagna kind of comes in. Um, it has a cuticle layer on the top that kind of protects that leaf. It has a layer of cells under that that are called the upper epidermis. Uh, and then it has some cells that are um, vertical and we call those the palisade layer. Um, and so you've got kind of all of these different layers going down. So we've talked about three so far. Um, underneath the palisade layer is the spongy mesophyll. And so within those two layers are where you're going to find your chloroplasts, which is something that we'll talk about in more detail today. Um, very important for plants to be able to photosynthesize. Um, and then you have a lower epidermis and a cuticle. And in the lower epidermis, you have these really unique cells called guard cells and stoma. Um, and so the plant will actually be able to exchange gases that way. Um, and looking at it with maybe a hand lens on certain species, you might be able to see a little bit of this, but you really do need to be aided by a microscope um, for most of the things that we're going to talk about today. And so I just wanted you to think about how those layers come through. So if I'm talking about it with my lasagna, um, you know, my noodle layer is kind of like that upper epidermis, right? And so I've got that sandwich on both sides. And then in the middle, I've got a lot going on. Um, there's peppers in there, there's carrots in there and tomato sauce and herbs and garlic, uh, spinach. And so just like a leaf looks maybe simple, we need to think about the leaf more like lasagna. <laughs> it's got so much going on inside of it. And um, we're gonna dig a little bit into plant cells in particular. Um, we're not going to talk about specialized cells probably until next session. Um, but I'm going to give you the general overview of what's going on in there. And so before I do that, I do want to just zoom out and rewind to think a little bit about microscopy and how these tools came to be of use to us. So uh, in 1590, two Dutch spectacle makers, um, they were a father and son team, Hans and Zacharias, Janssen created the first microscope and they were experimenting with different types of lenses as they had access to um, in their field of work. And so as they experimented, they found that if they put certain lenses together, they were able to magnify things, especially if they separated them with a tube. Um, and so it really kind of came about happenstance. Um, and then you can fast forward um, several years to 1665, and people had been looking through microscopes, uh, rudimentary microscopes, 
uh, and figuring out what's going on in these tiny little worlds that we can't see that are surrounding us. Um, and so in 1665, Robert Hooke published his Micrographia, uh, which outlined studies that he had done using a microscope. It was a best seller. Um, very, very interesting. It's, it was like science fiction to people. They didn't understand what they were looking at. The illustrations were very detailed. Uh, in order to be able to communicate what he was seeing through the microscope, Hook really needed to be a talented illustrator. Um, and I'm sure hopefully got some help with that because some of these are very detailed. Um, and just conveying this information and some people didn't believe that it was true you know there's some controversy there uh, but it's been obviously now we know that that's a thing um, but back then it was a little bit uh, jarring for people to think that there were things in their world that they couldn't observe with their naked eye in 1675 anton van Leeuwenhoek. Yes, it's pronouncing that right. Um, so not Robert, this is Anton. Uh, used a microscope with one lens to observe insects and other specimens. And he was also the first one to observe bacteria. And so these are very important people in the history of plant anatomy because they laid the groundwork for what came later. Um, in 1931, Max Knoll and Ernst Ruska invented the first electron microscope. Uh, if you have not seen electron microscopy images, I highly recommend you do a little Google search uh, and check it out because some of the things that they're able to capture through that tool um, are just otherworldly. I mean, very, very neat. So basically they um, wanted to magnify things beyond the limits of what light could do. So there are optical limitations for light. And so they um, are limited for 500 to 1,000 times magnification. And so they built this electron micro microscope that transmits a beam of electrons through the specimen. Whoa. Uh, and then they can record it and transform that into an image. Um, very neat. So there are a couple of different types of electron microscopes. Um, one of them is a transmission electron microscope and the other is a scanning electron microscope. Um, and so you can kind of look at the different images that you see from both of those. Uh, when I went to Miami University of Ohio, uh, they had a really neat microscopy lab. And so you were able to see these microscopes um, and they had to be in special rooms and they no dust, you know, it's like everything's inside a vacuum inside the microscope, um, making sure that it was perfect. But I remember the professors that were using it were a little frustrated because it wasn't on the ground floor and just like the natural kind of movement of buildings that we don't really feel on a day to day basis would sometimes show up in the images. Um, and so I think they, they did redo the department since I've been there, and, uh, but they put those microscopes on the ground floor. Um, really cool stuff. And as I was kind of looking into this uh, history of microscopes, I discovered a current one that is top of the line. Um, Dino light digital microscopes are handheld. They look like a large pen. Um, they're about 1500 bucks and they can offer a magnification of 900 times. And you could take this out into the field with you. You can plug it into your computer and instantly get images from it. I mean, just amazing things that we can now do thanks to the work of these spectacle makers, um, all the way back in 1590. And so if you go out and you get a dino light, let me know. <laughs> I want to I want to check it out. I wish we had one here. Um, and so we'll rewind just a little bit um, back to Robert Hooke um, in 1665. He looked at lots of different things, uh, but he did look at some plant material. And so he looked at cork and found that it was made up of little pores or cells. 
um, which was actually the first time that that term was coined. And so it's pretty neat that, you know, just in his uh, initial looking of things, we have kept that word um, and now it's so ubiquitous. So when we talk about plant and animal cells, maybe we didn't even think about the origin of where that came from. Um, and so he was very excited to see this under the microscope because he said, oh, that's why cork floats. That's why cork is able to be smushed and put into a bottle to stop it. Um, really neat. And so he was like, oh, that's why that's happening. Uh, it explained that phenomenon to him. And um, in that one little sentence coined this word cell, which we still use today. So after uh, he was working on his things, a man named Nehemiah Grew um, in 1682 published The Anatomy of Plants. And so he's kind of considered the father of plant anatomy, um, one of those very early uh, workers in the field. And his Anatomy of Plants was a collection of republished previous publications. Um, but it was divided into four books. He had the anatomy of vegetables begun, anatomy of roots, anatomy of trunks, and anatomy of leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. And so you can take a look at some of these images that they were drawing and they were relating to. Um, and again, still coming up with some controversy. People just were, oh, no way. There's no way that there are organized pieces of plants. They're not higher intelligent life forms. You know, it just wasn't widely accepted. Um, and so Nehemiah Grew continued his work and continued to publish um, and described so many pieces of plant structure that were just, you know, blowing people's minds, basically. <laughs> um, he, he also described key differences of morphology um, in stems and roots and showed that the flowers of the Asteraceae are built of multiple units. So in our previous class, we discussed how a sunflower has hundreds of flowers in a single head together. Um, the flowers on the outside are called ray flowers and they have the petals. And then you have the disc flowers that are on the inside. And so you're able to see all of those different pieces coming together. Um, so we also have to, him to thank for looking at um, the first microscopic description of pollen. Uh, looking at pollen under a microscope is fascinating to me. National Geographic came out a few years ago with beautiful imagery that had been you know, artistically colored um, but of different types of pollen and just thinking about, yes, occasionally it gets into our <laughs> respiratory issues and uh, maybe we don't all love pollen all the time, but they're, it's complex, multicellular pieces of these plants um, to be able to look at them together. And so we're thinking about cells, we're thinking about microscopy, um, and so let's talk a little bit more about plant cells. Now, plant cells are different from animal cells because they have a wall, a cell wall. And so animal cells are not rigid as plant cells are um, because we need to move around and do all the things that we like to do. Um, but plant cells have a wall. So it's pretty easy when you're looking at a picture of a plant cell versus an animal cell. An animal cell will typically be shown round and a plant cell will be shown as more rectangular. Um, and it tends to be larger than animal cells as well. Um, there are several components within a cell that are called organelles, and they perform different functions for the cell. And so some of these organelles include membranes and ribosomes. There's something called the Golgi apparatus, a nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, cytoplasm, chloroplast, mitochondria, um, really uh, there's a lot, a lot going on <laughs> inside the cell. We won't talk about all of them today, but we will highlight a few. Um, so let's talk about that cell wall first. And so looking under the microscope, it was clear to these researchers that they were looking at uh, a, a structure, 
a darkened structure typically. So when you look at something under a microscope, you will usually use a dye of some kind. Uh, you can use a gram stain for other types of um, observations. You can stain certain proteins. Um, I'll discuss in a little bit a kind of simple way to make your own slide of plant cells that you can observe. Um, and that dye includes iodine. And so it'll, it'll stain the starches. So we're just kind of thinking about ways that we can actually see what's going on in that cell. But the walls were very uh, obvious to these researchers and would be to you too if you tried it out. And so that provides structure to the cell. Uh, there's also a membrane that is semi-permeable um, that is in with the cell wall and it's composed of a thin layer of protein and fat. Um, it's really important for this membrane to be intact because it can regulate what comes in and out of the cell. Um, and so different markers will uh, allow that membrane to open up, to release something or to accept something into the cell that needs to be there. The nucleus is a very important part of the cell. And so this is the uh, part that is gonna be most visible to kind of the simple researcher. So my uh, basic botany class that I run for the Master Gardener program includes a section where we take some onion skin um, and we just take that really small top layer of the onion skin um, and we put it onto a slide and then we'll put a little drop of iodine on it and then we'll be able to put a cover slip on and look at that under the microscope. At about 40 times magnification you can easily see the cell walls and you can see the nucleus because the nucleus accepts that dye very well. Um, now let me make sure that I'm being clear too. It's not like the hard paper skin on the outside of the onion. It would be like a very thin layer of like the first or second um, layer of that onion. So it's translucent uh, until you put the dye on. And so uh, it's a really neat activity to do. I've also done it with high schoolers and uh, sets you up for success. So if you have a microscope at home, a compound microscope at home, uh, I encourage you to try that. And you can do a little Googling too if you want kind of step-by-step step, or I'm happy to provide that if you would like. Um, so inside this nucleus, uh, we are going to be finding the storage of DNA. Um, and so it's very dense. And so it has a lot of information. That is like basically where the brain is, it has all the information for the cell. Um, and so this nucleus is only present in eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles um, and are typically unicellular, um, but eukaryotic cells are multicellular, usually, um, and so we share that um, type of nucleus with plants as well, so we have a similarity there. Um, the plastids are also very important organelles within the cell. They have their own DNA. Um, they are necessary to store starches and carry out the process of photosynthesis. Now I'm not going to go into photosynthesis today because that's actually part of plant physiology um, and so that's going to be in a few more sessions. Um, so stay tuned for a deep dive into photosynthesis. Um, but it also, those plastids are also used in the synthesis of many molecules and are kind of the building blocks of the cell. So you have leucoplasts, which are non-photosynthetic tissue, um, and they store proteins, lipids, and starch. You have chromoplasts um, that are color plastids, and it's pigment synthesis and stores photosynthetic eukaryotic, storage for eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms. Uh, chromoplasts have red, orange, and yellow colored pigments, which provide color to our ripe fruits and flowers. And so those uh, types of pieces of the cell can sometimes be altered um, or mutated in a way that we are excited about if we see, oh my gosh, that tulip has a stripe on it. Um, or there's variegation in that part of the leaf. Um, so the chromoplasts there are um, 
being tampered with in some way, um, and not necessarily by a human hand, but um, you know, there's always causes for cells to be um, just a little bit different depending on how they form and the conditions under which they form. Um, you also have chloroplasts, which most of you have probably heard of. Uh, these are kind of long, um, I guess they kind of look like a, a bean, um, and they are enclosed by a phospholipid membrane, and it's they're inside the chloroplast. There is um, stroma and thylakoid stacks of grana uh, that actually within those stacks, that's where photosynthesis is carried out. And um, all of that part of photosynthesis is carried out, but the absorption of the light that plants need uh, is very important and happens within those chloroplasts. Um, chloroplasts have a green colored pigment called chlorophyll um, and it absorbs light energy from the sun and uses it to transform carbon dioxide and water into glucose. So most plants are green um, and that is coming from the chlorophyll that is located within the chloroplasts. Now there are also other wavelengths of light that plants use. And so there are other pigments in there. You have carotenoids, which are yellow and orange, and you have anthocyanins, which are kind of red or pink. And what happens to our plants here in the Cincinnati region in the fall is that the plants will start to get ready for dormant season and they will stop producing chlorophyll. Um, and so the chlorophyll will start to die out, um, cells need to regenerate to be healthy, and so as the chlorophyll starts to die out, you see the carotenoids and the anthocyanins more dominantly. And so that's what our beautiful color change is. And so those pigments exist in the leaf most of the time, uh, they're just masked by that chlorophyll. And so it's nice when we get them to shine a little bit. Also, certain plants in the fall will produce more of those pigments, those colorful pigments, because the light that they're receiving is um, less direct. And so they'll still try to have kind of a last grab um, for some of that light. But typically, we're seeing you know kind of the slow death of a leaf um, before senescence and, and it leaves and falls on the ground. Um, so that's your little cool tip. You can tell people that you know why the leaves change color. Uh, so there are two distinct regions present inside a chloroplast. Uh, let's talk about the grana. They are made up of stacks of disc-shaped structures known as thylakoids. And they consist of those chlorophyll pigments um, and are the functional units. Um, usually the stacks of thylakoids um, are about 10 to 20. Um, and so they look kind of like, um, you know, like Mentos <laughs> coming out of the tube. So if you like just stacked a few of them up and then you wrapped all that together into your little kidney bean shape, uh, making sure that you're keeping it green, um, then that's kind of what a chloroplast is looking like. The stroma is a heterogeneous ma matrix which contains the grana and is similar to the cytoplasm within a cell. Uh, we haven't really talked much about the cytoplasm, but it is a uh, fluid uh, within the cell and um, it contains, the, the stroma contains various enzymes, DNA, ribosomes, and other substances. And so looking at a cross-section of these chloroplasts must have just been so amazing for these early researchers, uh, really seeing like what is inside this leaf. And so going beyond even the mesophyll that we discussed and um, you know, going past those cuticles and seeing the stroma on the other side, uh, the stoma on the other side of a leaf um, where that gas exchange happens. I, I just, it would have been neat to be a fly on the wall uh, when that was happening. And so uh, we'll talk more about chloroplasts uh, when we talk about photosynthesis, but all of that's happening in that part of the cell. 
very important. There's also a vacuole um, within the cell, like kind of a big air pocket. Uh, it occupies about 30% of the cell's volume. And the tonoplast is the membrane that surrounds the vacuole. Um, and so the vacuole is important because it can sustain turgor pressure against the cell wall. And when we talked about mimosa sensitive plant, um, we mentioned how that turgor pressure was released when you touch the leaves of that particular plant and everything just kind of falls down. Um, and so it's really important to have this central vacuole so that the plants are able to shift when they need to um, and just keep everything as rigid as possible, um, but also flexible. Uh, for a long time, I was taught that there was just kind of unknown what was going on in the vacuole or if it had other purposes um, besides just kind of filling that space and making sure that the uh, organelles, you know, were in their right places. Um, but they're finding more and more that there is a function to this kind of previously just thought air bubble. Um, and so we're still doing a lot of research on that. And so um, the Golgi apparatus is also found in all eukaryotic cells. So we share that uh, with our plant friends. And that distributes synthesized macromolecules to various parts of the cell. There are ribosomes, which are the smallest membrane bound organelles and they comprise RNA and protein. Um, and they are sites for protein synthesis and are kind of considered the protein factory for the cell. Mitochondria are also present. They produce energy through cellular respiration. Um, and during respiration, which we'll also talk about during plant physiology, these parts of the cells use oxygen and glucose to make energy. Um, carbon dioxide and water. And so this will be a, a cool deep dive when we go into it, you know, as we're young and we're taught, oh, you know, the plants are making oxygen for us and isn't that wonderful? And that is true, but plants also respire um, different times during their photosynthetic cycle. Um, they will actually give off carbon dioxide. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there is a cycle to how the plants are producing uh, these different gases that are in our atmosphere. Um, and so I just want to do a little review, and then I'll open up the chat. Um, today we talked a little bit about cells, and we talked about some of the organelles within the cells and the different things that they do. Uh, we didn't talk about all of them because there are a lot and new things being discovered all the time. Um, but we did, you know, make sure that we covered the fact that plant cells have walls that are visible and that we have a nucleus um, that is also fairly easy to see under a microscope. Uh, we talked a little bit about the history of microscopy and how these researchers developed their different um, observations and how they communicated those observations. Um, and then at the beginning, we talked about how a leaf is like lasagna. <laughs> um, and you've got your epidermal layers and your mesophyll, um, and all of those different parts work together. And so the more we look into uh, the tiny worlds around us, I think the more appreciation we can have for the complexities of nature and there's always something new to discover. Um, I've been very uh, interested to see some of the new microscopy techniques that are coming out um, and just the images that are being produced and it sometimes is really hard to put into context of what we're looking at um, and it's nice to be surprised by a plant every now and then. Um, so looking ahead, I'll see you all in two weeks and we'll talk about tissue types. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that mesoville. We'll talk a little bit more about our epidermal layers. We'll talk about the ways that tissues are arranged in plants. Um, we have mentioned xylem and phloem in previous sessions. And so we'll be discussing a little bit more about xylem and phloem. Your homework, remember, was to tell us about your favorite organelle. You can share that with us on Facebook or social media. 
be sure to tag us. Um, if I had to pick a favorite, I mean, chloroplasts are pretty cool, and uh, I think that obviously they're very necessary, so I, I find them to be pretty neat. I wish that I had chloroplasts sometimes, and when I was hungry, I could just stay out in the garden, um, keep working or chilling, uh, and just absorb some of that sunlight and turn that into energy for myself. Uh, so we'll see if they're going to adapt that in the future. Uh, but thank you all so much. I'll go ahead and 